one o'clock having arrived, I'm going to call this um, February 17th, 2022 meeting of the Taxes Committee to order under rules 10.01 uh, remote hearings. And also a reminder to those uh, watching that if you want access to any of the documents for this Taxes Committee, go to the Minnesota Legislature website, go to the House of Representatives, to committees and divisions, go to Taxes Committee, and on that homepage, uh, look down to the lower right, you will have all of those things. So Ms. Griska, first order of business is to take the roll. Representative Mark Hurt. Mark Hurt, present. Representative Mark Hurt, present. Representative Liz Lagarde. Representative Liz Lagarde, present. Representative Liz Lagarde, present. Representative Davids. Davids, present. Representative Davids, present. Representative Agbaje is excused. Representative Carlson. Carlson's here. Representative Carlson present. Representative Detmer. Detmer present. Representative Detmer is present. Representative Garofalo. Representative Gomez. Gomez present. Representative Gomez is present. Representative Her. Her present. Representative Her is present. Representative Hertoss. Hertoss present. Representative Hertoss present. Representative Howard. Howard present. Representative Howard present. Representative McDonald. McDonald present. Representative McDonald present. Representative Miller. Representative Moran. Present. Representative Moran present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Mortensen present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Robbins present. Representative Sundell. Present. Representative Sundell present. Representative Schultz. Present. Representative Schultz present. Representative Stevenson. Present. Representative Stevenson present. Representative Swazinski. Present. Representative Swazinski present. Representative Joachim. Present. Representative Joachim present. We have a quorum. Ms. Griska, thank you so much. Next order of business is to approve the February 16th, 2022 minutes of the Taxes Committee. Representative McDonald, would you like the honors? Yes, I approve the taxes as <laughs> the minutes as written. All uh, right, we'll make that motion. We still have to approve them, Representative McDonald. You cannot solely approve them, but you can make the motion. So we have the McDonald motion to approve the February 16, 2022 minutes. Any comments, clarifications? If not, if I could ask you to temporarily unmute yourselves, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion does prevail. The February 16th, 2022 uh, minutes are approved. So members, this is kind of the second day of um, you know, the focus again, uh, a lot of focus in this tax committee is going to be addressing the workforce shortage. And so yesterday we had a big idea. Today's another big idea on how we can uh, not only retain young workers and families but attract young workers and families to the state of Minnesota. And so we have first up House File 3283, the only bill we're going to hear today. Who would like to move that bill for Representative Kotitsa Latoum? Mr. Chair, I'll move the bill. Representative Joaquin moves to lay over House File 3283 for possible inclusion into the omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Katitsa Matun, welcome to the Taxes Committee. And I know you have an A1 amendment, um, and I think it looks pretty technical. So if someone would move the A1 uh, amendment, if that's okay, Representative Katitsa Matun, we could put this on and then you could explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Mr. Chair, I'll move the A1. Representative Joaquin moves the A1 amendment. Um, Representative Katitsa Watoon, what does that do? Um, it, it is, like you mentioned, Mr. Chair, a very technical amendment, um, and we're just um, getting the bill in the shape that we'd like to go forward. Very good. Any other thoughts or comments on that, members? 
If not, I'm going to call for the vote on approval of the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Uh, the motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, and before we go to the bill, uh, Representative Garofalo is in attendance. So Representative Katitsa Watoon, if you could explain your House File 3283 as amended to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, House File uh, 3283 is um, a really exciting bill and I'm, I'm grateful to be here uh, back in Texas and sharing it with you today. So before COVID-19 hit, we knew that our childcare system was broken. Uh, parents can't afford to pay more for care. Early childhood educators and child care providers are struggling to support their own families on low wages, and the pandemic has exacerbated all of these issues. There are myriad families across the state of Minnesota who pay as much as or even twice as much as their mortgage payment in child care. Uh, just a few years ago, when we had three children under the age of five, that was the reality for my family. A tax cut to help these families pay for child care puts money back in their pockets to spend on housing, food, or uh, spending on other things in, in our economy. In addition, we're facing a critical workforce shortage. We've seen a disparate number of uh, women leave the workforce in order to care for their children. Young workers are often young parents with young children. Currently in the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin offer no state-based child care tax credit. Iowa does offer two options for taxpayers with an annualized income under $45,000 a year. The Great Start Child Care Tax Credit says to families with young children, you're welcome in Minnesota. We want you to live, work, and raise your families here, and we will help you do it. Until a child turns five and is eligible to begin kindergarten, public investment at either the state or federal level is marginal at best. While some temporary programs throughout the pandemic have provided some assistance to young families, no permanent relief has been passed. The Minnesota legislature has the opportunity to do what no other state has done and expand our current dependent care credit into the Great Start Depend Child Care and Dependent Care Credit. Here is how we will do it. So currently, uh, families with only one child are um, only able to claim up to $3,000 of child care related costs. Families with two or more children are only able to claim up to $6,000 of childcare related costs and larger families are provided no additional benefit. The Great Start Child Care Tax Credit will allow families with one child under the age of five to claim up to $10,000 in childcare related costs. Families with two young children can claim up to $20,000 in childcare related expenses and families with three or more children may claim an additional $5,000 for a total of $25,000 of childcare related expenses. The Great Start um, Child Care and Dependent Care credit is refundable. The credit will cover 50% of these costs until the taxpayer's annual growth income exceeds $125,000 a year, at which point it phases down to covering 20% of those eligible costs. After gross annual income exceeds $400,000, the covered percentage phases down to zero, and only one credit can be claimed per household. For children under the age of one, the maximum amount of qualifying expenses is assumed, and this is just to reflect the unique challenges of raising and caring for a newborn, as well as the much higher cost of childcare for our very young children. This bill, members, not only lifts up Minnesota children and families, but it's a much needed support to our economy as we rebound from the pandemic. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would invite our testifiers to share their thoughts, and I will stand for questions. Very good. Thank you, Representative Katitsa with two. And just before you go on, just the revenue estimate on the bill. I always like to mention that if the authors have not. So uh, you should all have this, members. But for 2023, the cost uh, would be 203.5 million. For 2024, 209.4 million. And for fiscal year 2025, 211. Uh, 0.3 million. And just for clarification, and I, I, you said this, but so for one child age zero to four, the maximum credit could be up to 5,000. And for two children, zero to four, 10,000. And for three or more children, zero to four would be $12,500 credit. Is that correct, Representative? Mr. Chair, that, that it's covered at 50%. So yes, that, that is, those are numbers are correct. Okay. They can claim twice that amount. All right. Thank you very much. 
So let's go to the testifiers before we go to members. And we do have nine testifiers. So I'd like to ask all the testifiers to limit your uh, testimony to three minutes, uh, if you would. And so uh, first is Lars Nexted, and then Nicole Leithauser is on deck. So Lars Nexted, if you would identify yourself, there you are, and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Lars Nexted, and I am the policy director for Isaiah. Isaiah is a statewide organization of congregations, mosques, child care centers, and barbershops. Our mission, excuse me, our, our mission is to build a democracy that respects every person's dignity and a caring economy where everyone can thrive. I'm speaking today on behalf of Kids Count on Us, a coalition of 512 child care centers serving over 25,000 children across Minnesota. No matter where they live or what they look like, every Minnesota child deserves an enriching environment, especially during their formative early years. Yet for too long, we have failed to ensure support for families with young children. The truth is our childcare system is broken and dangerously close to collapse. Many people without young children don't realize that it costs more to put a child in childcare than in college. Yet most families with young children are still early in their working lives. In other words, we expect the most financially of families when they are least able to afford it. At the same time, we ask childcare workers to do the most important and arguably most challenging work in the state, I'm a parent of a 10 and 12 year old, so it wasn't too long ago and I recall this, for wages that are among the lowest of any in, in, in any industry. Child care centers are facing a crisis uh, in finding and retaining staff. The lack of public support for child care keeps people out of the workforce. It drives the gender pay gap. It means too many children don't get the early education they need to thrive. This failure hurts everyone in our state but it, hurts, it, it hits families of Black, Indigenous, and people of color the hardest. The COVID pandemic has highlighted the precarious position of childcare in our nation. The truth is we need to overhaul how we think about childcare, expanding access to affordable care while upgrading the quality of jobs in the sector. This will take a large public investment, but one that will reap great rewards in better health, education, and economic outcomes. As you will hear from other testifiers, most families with young children struggle to pay for childcare. This bill would provide much needed support to those families. We thank Representative Kotiza Watoon for authoring this bill and urge your support. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, next, we have Nicole Weithauser and then Laura Gannon on deck. So there you are, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Marquardt and committee members. My name is Nicole Lighthouser and I live in Cottage Grove. I am a single parent to three children and I appreciate your time very much today. I wanna share my story as a single mother trying to afford childcare and urge you to support HF 3283. Childcare costs are completely unaffordable in our state for most families. It was so unaffordable for me that I had to quit teaching in early childhood special ed to work in childcare. After I had my second child, I decided to run childcare out of my home because I could not afford to pay childcare for two children. I did this for five years, during which time I had my third child and then went through a divorce. That led to my return to teaching because I had to show more income on paper in order to be able to refinance my home in my name only to keep it. Finding childcare for three kids at that point was nearly impossible. My income was $30 too much to qualify for assistance. I was only able to make it happen because a new neighbor moved in that ran an in-home childcare and she gave me a huge discount. But Minnesota families should not have to rely on the kindness of their neighbors to afford childcare. And those neighbors shouldn't have to take a loss of income either. The pandemic compounded a system that was already in distress. My school age children were too young to be on their own for distance learning, but I couldn't pay for childcare. I had to choose between working and helping my kids. I eventually started helping my neighbor with her childcare so I could do both, but it was a huge pay cut. 
we were barely scraping by last spring when I was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer and which required aggressive treatment. My chemo required me to be inpatient for one week at a time, every three weeks for months. Every person who has experienced cancer knows the devastating costs of being ill in this country. I have no savings. I have student loans from returning to school to get my master's with the hope of a higher paying job. I had to empty my retirement account, the little bit that I had to pay bills and my house is in forbearance because I am not able to return to work yet post-treatment. My story is unfortunately not unique. There are so many parents across the state dealing with similar challenges. There are also many parents working multiple full-time jobs to make ends meet who still cannot afford childcare. I urge you to support this bill and make a huge difference in the lives of so many. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Leihauser, and hopefully your health situation is good. So, thank you. Um, next is Laura Gannon and on deck, Ronnie Bradkey. Hello Welcome again, Chair Mark. Good to see Hi. you. <laughs> Hello again, Chair Mark and members of the committee. My name is Laura Gannon, and I was just here yesterday testifying for Rep Heard's student loan tax credit bill. I'm here again, in this time in support of Rep. Katie uh, Whitehoom's bill expanding the child tax credit bill. Um, that's HF 3283. I'm grateful to the tax committee and that they're both taking on these bills this session because they would go a long way to help families like mine. As I mentioned yesterday, I live in Circle Pines, Minnesota with my husband and two kids. My youngest is three years old and attends a nonprofit preschool that is high quality and yet the most affordable in our area. We love her preschool and the excellent learning environment that the staff members excel at creating. However, it is a huge financial burden for two working parents who don't qualify for any assistance. As I stated yesterday, our current monthly childcare bill is as much as our mortgage. So in order to pay for our mortgage, my student loan and full-time preschool, we have to pay the equivalent of three mortgages every month. Our childcare costs are through the roof with two kids. And like many parents, my student loan debt only compounds the larger problem. We moved to Minnesota because I was offered a position with better pay in a state with a better cost of living than we had in Silicon Valley. We knew childcare costs would be less in Minnesota. However, the cost of childcare for a child under five is still incredibly hard to pay here. I will admit that it is such a difficult expense to pay that I'm currently behind on payments and playing catch up. Um, due to emergent unexpected expenses. I'm currently waiting for my yearly performance share to pay out so that I can pay that balance off. I'm lucky to have this option as many working families do not. Chair Marquardt, I appreciate your focus this session on bills that can help families like mine experiencing the immense weight of both student debt and childcare costs. I also want to thank Rep. Kate Zellwithoon for bringing this bill forward. It would be an immense relief to be able to claim a tax credit like this and continues to show us that Minnesota is a great place to live and raise a family in. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up is Ronnie Bradkey. On deck is Claire Leinish. So Ronnie Bradkey. Hi. Yes, thank well, you, Mark. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Hi, yes, my name is Ronnie Bradkey, um, and I'm here to share my support for HF 3283. My husband, Ben, and I live in St. Paul, and we have two young children, Clark, who is three and a half, and Carolyn, who is almost two. Ben is a grocer, an essential worker. I work in higher education. So far, we have never had full-time daycare for both children due to lack of affordability and availability. At my very first appointment with my OBGYN back in 2017, she asked if I was on daycare waitlist and was worried for me that I wasn't. I was only eight weeks pregnant. We have made this work for three and a half years by splitting shifts, working early in the morning, late in the evening, and on weekends. We are fortunate to have jobs that allow this flexibility, knowing it wouldn't be possible for everyone. When we first started looking for full-time daycare for both children, most places had wait lists that were months long. The one place we could find with available spots was a childcare center that cost $308 a week per child. We knew we could never afford the $2,500 a month that would cover both kids full-time. That was more than twice our rent. 
37% of our income before taxes. Instead, we enrolled them in the center for two days a week for a total of $1,600 a month, giving us enough breathing room that neither of us needed to quit our jobs as we, shift, as we split shifts, taking yet another essential worker or another woman out of the employment pool. Despite the slight breathing room, we couldn't save any money. We couldn't work toward buying a house. We had no emergency fund. Finally, we caught a break. A friend referred us to a home daycare, a unicorn, a block from our house and only $144 a week per kid. The catch? She couldn't take anyone under two and this was her very first opening since before the pandemic started. Great for us, but hardly a systemic solution and only available to us because we were lucky enough to know the right person. We've been at this daycare for nearly a year, continuing to split shifts to cover our youngest child's care. She will join her brother when she turns two in April, bringing our monthly cost to $1,200. Still more than our rent, but for the first time in three and a half years, we'll both be able to work at the same time and spend more time together as a family. This bill would have made the last few years so much easier. We would have had more options, not needing to grab on to the first place in our price range. Daycare teachers could be paid with their worth instead of what we parents can scrape together to pay leading to more expertise and less turnover. We could work sooner toward long-term financial stability for our children. I'd like to thank Representative Cotiza Wittoon for bringing forward this bill and ask the committee to support it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, Claire Leinish and on deck, Eric Bernstein. So Claire Leinish, there you are. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself. Sure thing. Thanks so much for having me. Can you all hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my name is Claire Lennon. Thank you, Chair Marquardt, and all the committee members for having me today. Um, I'm here to share support also for HF 3283. Uh, I live in St. Paul and am a licensed family child care provider. I mainly serve St. Paul families out of the daycare in my home, the Daffville Day School, and I have a mixed age care environment. Uh, I've been doing this work for seven years with most families sending me their tiny babies and keeping them with me until kindergarten. I have one child myself, and one of the best parts of my job is watching her learn from the older kids and seeing the older ones learn empathy and kindness in relation to the young kids. And of course, the other mean perk is not having to look for child care for my own child. Um, the parents I serve are extremely dedicated to their child or children's well-being, and we work together as a team to support their children through all the big life stuff of the early years. And these parents have chosen me because I provide consistency of care, healthy food, lots of time outside, and a focus on social and emotional growth. They value the work that I do and pay me market rate for my services. And we can all agree that while it's a tremendous expense for them, it's barely enough. As a result, most uh, of my families have only one expense larger than their childcare every year, and that's their mortgage. A few years into my business, I instituted a policy of a 3% raise of my rates every year so families can plan for that. This policy is still in place, and while it provides my family a level of financial stability, I do tremendously feel for my daycare parents. Every year, the cost of food goes up, the cost of gas to and from their jobs, their property taxes go up, and now I have added to the consistency of this climb. When the parents pay me, I use this money to pay my mortgage, pay my taxes, both the employer and the employee portion, portion as I am self-employed, buy health insurance for my family as we have no employer coverage option. And then what's left, we save for our retirement and our daughter's college. The spending of my daycare families is largely the same with many facing the added cost of supporting aging family members and or paying student loans. As Many have already talked about, and I'm sure many committee members know, the early years of parenthood are no logistical walk in the park. Finding quality childcare is ridiculously hard, if not impossible. Being able to afford it at all is not a given, and for many, question, for many families, it's completely out of the question. Increasing this tax credit would not only be a token of respect to the parents trying to provide healthy and safe environments to their children, but also a real tangible bottom line difference for the families that I serve. This bill could be a meaningful first step toward addressing the myriad of issues that face parents and providers as we all try to navigate this industry while giving our children away. Uh, thank you so much, Rep. Katiza Wittoon, for bringing forward the bill, and thank you all for having me today. Um, happy to be here. Thank you very much for your testimony and for work you do, and you're holding on to some very, our very precious future there. So thank you. Uh, like to uh, note, Representative Miller is now in attendance. Uh, next up is Eric Bernstein and Jennifer Olson on deck. 
Um, Eric Bernstein. Hi, hi, Chair Marquardt, Thank members you, of the committee. Welcome uh, to the committee. Thank you. Um, Chair Marquardt, members of the committee, uh, my name is Eric Bernstein, uh, and I'm policy director at We Make Minnesota. Um, I'm happy to be here today to testify in favor of HF 3283, which would greatly expand Minnesota's dependent care credit, providing essential relief to families struggling to cope with our broken child care system. Uh, I think the committee has an easy job today. Everyone knows that child care in Minnesota is scarce and unaffordable, and that we as a state and as a country are vastly underinvesting in early childhood care and education. The Federal Reserve found that Minnesota spends $10,000 per child between the ages of 5 and 17, but just $2,500 on children aged 3 and 4, and only $900 per child uh, for the first three years of life. Um, in 2020, Deed reported that Minnesota was short an estimated 80,000 child care slots, and according to the Center for American Progress, the average cost for center-based care in 2021 was $16,200 for an infant and $14,100 for a toddler. As a percentage of family earnings, Deed found that center-based care would consume 16 to 19% of median Minnesota household income, and as much, uh, as much as 38% of household income for Black families, and more than 50% for single parents. This places many Minnesotans in the impossible position of picking between working and paying the high cost of care or staying home to save. The problem this creates for our workforce is a matter of broad consensus. I, I'm not sure if they're here to support this bill today, but in its Minnesota 2030 report, the Chamber of Commerce named affordable childcare as one of the top three priorities for ensuring a strong economy over the next decade and beyond. This tax credit would be a great first step towards achieving that objective, and I very much hope it will pass this session. Um, however, I'd like to make one note based on some recent research that was in the media. Um, recent studies have cast some doubt on the much celebrated benefits of early childhood care, and the upshot of that conversation suggested that not all child care is equal and that the quality of child care sought differs substantially by income. So although this bill will help many families struggling with large child care expenditures, it may unequally benefit or exclude some low-income households that seek cheaper care or avoid childcare expenses altogether. Um, children of these lower-income households will not benefit from the high-quality developmental environments um, and will find themselves at a comparative disadvantage to their higher-income peers. So I think this is a great bill, but a universal system or a child care credit would afford families and children um, more similar benefits and opportunities, regardless of race or income. So I hope that in addition to passing SF3283, the committee will consider the funding needs of longer term solutions, more universal solutions, and protect the revenues that those programs will require. So um, just don't cut taxes, um, especially not for rich people. That was the last part there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, next up is Jennifer Olson and on deck, Daniel Indovino Cowley. Jennifer Olson. There you are, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Jennifer Olson. I'm a member of AFSCME Council 5, Local 2440, and I'm also the mother of a beautiful six-year-old girl. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the hardship that Minnesota's families experience due to the child care costs. When I became pregnant, I was told to look for child care as soon as possible as openings, especially for infants, were in short supply. I was quoted prices ranging from $200 to $350 a week, which was 20 to 34% of my net income. I secured daycare for my child five months before she was born. I was told I would need to pay for her spot prior to her birth for the remainder of my pregnancy and through my eight week parental leave, six weeks of which were completely unpaid. I would have to pay for a daycare spot, not even occupied by my child. This isn't uncommon. Sometimes it's a reduced rate. Sometimes it's full price. Shortly after reserving the spot, the provider told me the spot was no longer available. So I was not required to pay for the spot. I was later fortunate to secure childcare with a family member for a reduced cost. Just before my daughter was a year old, I found an affordable daycare provider. It took me seven months to find an affordable daycare provider. By affordable, I mean she charged just under $200 a week for one child. The provider was new to childcare, and as a result, she had slightly reduced her rates when compared with the prices I was quoted prior to my daughter's birth. Even at the slightly reduced rate, it was difficult to afford. I took on a second job to pay for daycare. 
Before my daughter was a year old, I was working two jobs to help cover the cost of her child care. My daughter was in this daycare for about six months when the provider suffered a medical emergency and it rendered her unable to provide care. I was notified of this on a Sunday and had to find child care for my daughter immediately. This time I didn't have seven months to search. I was at the mercy of whatever provider had an opening for whatever price they wanted. That price turned out to be more than $250 a week. This was another hit to my household budget. I had to take on more hours at my second job. I even considered selling my house and living with my parents to make ends meet. Please think about that. As a single mother with two jobs and a house, I was in a position where daycare costs were so overwhelming to my household budget that I had to consider selling my home to stay, stay afloat. When compared with what a lot of Minnesota families experience, I actually had it pretty easy. I had resources, I had family available to help me. I shared expenses with my child's father. I was able to keep and get and keep a second job while my daughter was with her father. And if everything else came crashing down, I had a home with equity that I could sell and family that I could live with. I had resources and it was still extremely difficult. I can't imagine what people who have fewer resources experience, both in finding and paying for childcare. I'm from a rural area, so childcare is a bit less costly than it is in the metro area. Um, coworkers and family members that I have in the metro area have said they consider $350 a week, which is the top end of my initial daycare quote, to be pretty standard. And that cost went up for them from there. One of my coworkers has daycare expenses that exceed 40% of her family's income for two children, both she and her husband work full time. The cost of daycare and the lack of paid parental leave is causing families to delay having children. It's causing Ms. them to say- Ms. Olson, would you yep. kind of complete your test? Thank yep. you. I'm two left. Okay. Parents can't work without reliable and affordable childcare and businesses can't thrive without workers. So I ask that you please consider the Great Start Child Independent Care Credit and the benefits that it offers Minnesota families and businesses. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next up, Daniel and Avino Cowley, and then our final testifier, Jennifer Nelson, on deck. So Hi. there you are. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I am Danny and Davino Cowley, um, Danielle as well, and I want to thank you to the chair and for the committee to hear me today. Um, I'm here as a parent today, but I do also serve on the Early Childhood Advisory Council in Bloomington, as well as the Special Education Community Advisory, and I'm the outgoing chair for the Parenting uh, group at Best Buy Corporate. So I also, you know, have a lot of experience talking to parents about this issue. Um, I want to talk about my life though right now. So I have two kids, a three-year-old and an 18-month-old, both are which are in full-time daycare right now and have been since the end of my 12-week leave. My older child is in a daycare center, so which at three years that cost me $320 a week. My younger child is at an in-home daycare and his care is $250 a week. So together that's about $570. So I'm paying $30,000 a year in child care. Um, my children are split up because we couldn't afford the $400 a week for an infant. So um, while my oldest gets special education services and really needs the structure of a center, so we tried putting her in an in-home and her speech just didn't progress. She needed to be in a, in a center. Um, because of that, we spend almost two hours a day dropping off and picking up children. And that's time we could be spending with our kids, engaging them, loving them, teaching them, rather than taking them in and out of car seats and kind of leaving them without any developmental or entertainment in the car. Um, and after all that, after childcare, healthcare, and taxes, I only take home about 20% of my salary, and then most of that goes to student loans. So I'm working to pay bills and not to better my family, um, except for, I guess, healthcare. But. And then right now, I'm working for my mental health and to hold a place and a salary in the workforce, because I know that there is a penalty for me to leave the workforce for five years. But my husband and I often question if it's worth it. And if we weren't going to do it, which one of us would leave? Um, neither of us wants to stop working. We like our jobs, but does it really make sense if it's negatively impacting our families and not um, benefiting that much? And we're lucky. So just yesterday, I was on a text chain with other mothers across the metro who that was focused on childcare. Uh, more than one mother on the chain would have to pay more in childcare than they would be making at their jobs. So they literally couldn't afford to work, uh, which is unbelievable when you really think about it. And then some of them were single parents. So 
for them to, try, uh, to get child care, they have to consider leaving their kids in unsafe or untested environments, or even bringing their kids to work with them and leaving the workforce to take care of children increases um, my child's home, the barrier to leaving for uh, to leaving for those in domestic violence situations. Lack of access to childcare also drives a disproportionate amount of women from the workforce and leaves them open to isolation, financial dependence, and abuse. It's not just a poverty issue. It isn't just a workforce issue. It isn't just an equity issue. It's also a child safety issue. Um, and so I know this won't solve all of our childcare problems in the state, but it would lift a burden off of families and give at least a little bit more options for people to work and live in community. And lastly, while, when reading the bill, I noticed that it defines young child as one who doesn't turn five before December 31st of the year. But because of the way school district cutoffs work, that would mean parents of kids born between September 1st and December 31st would use a whole, lose a whole year of this childcare credit while still paying for full-time childcare because you can't start kindergarten um, if you are turned five after September 1st. So if you change this age to six, the problem would be solved. And I hope the committee takes this issue into consideration and changes the age so as not to penalize parents who have fall babies, like my November baby that's standing next to me right now. She's about to get on the bus for her special ed preschool. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thanks for those comments. Uh, up next then is Jennifer Nelson. Uh, welcome to the committee and please state your name and proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Marquardt and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jennifer Nelson and I live in St. Paul. I am a working parent of two young kids. They are seven and four. For seven years now, we've been paying for childcare. Uh, right now with one kid in preschool, we pay $1,300 a month for him to attend a community-based center which is a steep number approaching parity with our mortgage payment, but it used to be a lot worse. Uh, when we had two kids in daycare, we were paying $2,200 a month for them to attend a community-based center, which far outstrips our monthly mortgage payment. This is all really hard on young families as a lot of people today have talked about. Um, when I was looking to advance my career a few years ago, the cost of childcare really limited my options. And if we'd had a third child, I would have been priced out of a job. Having paid tens of thousands of dollars, which is hard to think about in childcare over the last seven years, has also meant that we've had to put off other things and to save far less for our futures than we would have liked. We don't give families with young kids very many options. Um, we as families struggle through these years of incredibly high cost burdens because of how important childcare is to our kids and our families. It has been necessary to my family's stability, my career, and most importantly to my children's development. Um, and as an aside, this is also why it is so frustrating to know that the wonderful providers and teachers who have been part of our lives doing this skilled and critical work are so underpaid. That is an issue for another day maybe, but it is another piece of the puzzle, especially as we noted at the top of this meeting, you know, we're talking about how to deal with the worker shortage. Representative Cotiza Watoon's bill would get us moving in the right direction and significantly improve the child care cost burden that we place on families all over this state. Getting a tax credit for up to 50% of childcare expenses would make a material, tangible difference for families. So I thank you, Representative Koti Zowatun, for your leadership on this. And just as a quick anecdote, I told a few people this morning that I was doing this and immediately had two responses from great women in my life who said, you know, the first one said that um, she and her partner decided to have just one kid because of childcare costs. That was a really big factor for them. And another friend who's actually considering leaving the state, um, which was hard to hear um, because of childcare costs. So I will end it there, but I am happy to offer support for this bill. Thank you for having me, committee members, and Chair Mark Ward. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Anyone else that, before I go to members, that uh, or is on here that would like to testify on House File 3283 as amended. Uh, again, I wanna thank the testifiers for sharing your stories. And I think what came through here uh, was very uh, clear that uh, you know, raising a family is a very loving work, but uh, it's also difficult and hopefully cost should not be impacting life decisions that are being made. So hopefully this bill uh, can go a ways in, in solving that. So uh, I will now go to members, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me throw my camera on so that you know that it's really me. 
Um, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Tiza Wattoon, for bringing this forward. As I was hearing the testimony, um, I was, and I have a question for uh, Representative Tiza, the author, Tiza Wattoon, if I could, but in, in before that, I just, as I was listening, uh, you know, I was thinking about how our society, when we value something as a society, we, we, we usually show our support through tax credits or, or tax, at least through the taxes, we, we look at a way of helping that we've done that with home ownership, we've done that through a lot of different things. So I think this is an important thing. But the question that I have to the author, when I read through the bill, um, I see this as related to uh, parents who are in the workforce. Are we addressing in any way in this bill um, uh, holding up the pick? Because it's really important for us to raise our kids right and to have plenty of kids in our society. I'm fully supportive of that. But in the case of parents who choose to stay home, and as was heard through a lot of the testimony, that's a very big financial hit. And so is there any sort of uh, a way in this bill that people who choose to stay home with their kids rather than put them in daycare that they can benefit from um, a tax credit like this? Representative Katitza Watoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Miller, for that question. Um, I, I completely agree. Uh, kind of uh, looking at, at the, the language of this bill and um, kind of considering our options, uh, we really wanted to um, support obviously families who are re-entering the workforce after having a child, but um, you may have noticed, um, and, and I think I briefly mentioned it in my opening, but um, for, for children under the age of one, um, the maximum account, um, amount of qualifying expenses is actually assumed. So um, so if, a, if um, a parent is gonna leave the workforce for those first 12 months of their child's life, they are actually able to um, claim that, that uh, full amount for that child um, without actually having to uh, occur, uh, incur those expenses. So for the first 12 months, um, they are actually eligible for, for the maximum amount, which is one way that we're ho hopeful to encourage parents to take the time that they need to stay home with their babies. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do appreciate that. I, I do want to only make a distinction to make my point is, is I can support that, but understand that I know, I personally know many families and, and dare I say, this is what my family chose to do, but we purposely, and this is not just, not just for the mothers. I know, hus I know the fathers that stay home too, but they make, they make a deliberate choice to stay home um, with that child and raise them we'll say roughly speaking until when they, until that child goes to school, which is reflective of this five-year-old uh, thing. And so I would just encourage, uh, I'd like to see it in this bill. I'm also a realist, but I think we need, if, if we're truly going to be equitable in these things and, and affect all the people in the state of Minnesota the same way, there are a lot of people out by me in rural Minnesota, there are a lot of people where the parent chooses to stay home to raise that child. And if this is to ensure that we have um, safe, secure uh, health care or child care so that a child can grow up and be productive members of society, we need to include those people as well. Uh, they're taking a direct 100% hit on their, on their income. And uh, I think that it should be reflected in some way in our tax policies as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Miller. Representative Gomez. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Representative Katiza Watoon, for bringing this forward. And um, I just, I really want to thank the members of the public who've come and uh, and shared what's going on in their lives today. It really moved me um, a lot hearing the stories today and yesterday, and thinking about, you know, the ways that the ways that those struggles are connected in people's lives, um, and and the kind of like multiple burdens, and also just like you know, being a parent, knowing the impact that that stress has on the way that you're able to interact and connect with your kid and like show up for them and, and just like, you know, how important that is um, through, all, through all phases of their lives um, and the ways that we have a society that's structured so that that is so, so hard for people. Like it's so hard to do the human things that we want and need to do and that we feel, you know, that we feel compelled to do by like, our kind of deepest, most elemental humanity. Um, and, you know, it occurs to me that what we're seeing here is 
people who are who are laboring in a in a fundamentally broken system of of public support. Um, and you know, I, I like I'm just so I was just over here because thinking about about yesterday and and, and about this bill today, you know, I, I just was you know found some information on the internet and you know by by whatever whatever measure the United States is in the top you know what three to six richest countries in the world. Um, we are unique in our in the brokenness of this of these care systems in our countries, right? Like on every level, on healthcare, on housing, um, and certainly in, and on, on education and certainly in childcare, you know, um, the average, there's this like, you know, I mean, some countries spend $29,000, I think Denmark and kind of those, those, those uh, countries with the most, most generous social safety net, but you know, even a country that's much lower income than, than us, like Germany spends $10,000 for toddlers, this isn't even for babies, right? Per per toddler every year in public investment from the federal government in childcare. And in the United States, it's $500. Mr. Bernstein, I'm really glad I didn't know these numbers, right? But he said that it was, you know, $900 per child in Minnesota for, for, for kids that are one to three that we spend um, on this system. And, and it's not enough. I mean, it's just not enough. And so, and so I appreciate this effort and I'm obviously supportive of, of us materially improving the conditions of people's lives because that's what we're here to do. And this will do that. And so I'm supportive of this, but we cannot tax credit our way out of fundamentally broken care systems in our country. We cannot, you know, we, we can't marginally improve things which just we know leave vast amounts of people in the gap and babies, kids in our society in that gap of not getting what they need to like move on and 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 participate fully in our world. And so, you know, I like I said, I mean, I'm supportive of this. I'm supportive of the tax credit that we did yesterday, but it's like these stories from our communities really compel us to fundamentally examine the way that we are investing in the public good in our country and in our state. And so I'm I'm thankful for, you know, for the for the voices of of the people that bring that to us every day. But you know, it's just really striking me in all my committees, like, like just the deep struggle that our communities are in. And, and, you know, I just look forward to us thinking more comprehensively about how we respond to those to these needs. Um, so thank you so much, Representative, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. Well, I have a question for the author, but a comment for uh, in regards to Representative Gomez's comment uh, regarding health care and daycare and, and such others. Denmark, I have some friends from Denmark live here close to me in Delano. And of course, if you want a 60 to 80 percent tax on your income, then perhaps we can afford some of those programs and be so generous with taxpayers' monies. But frankly, I don't think that uh, we Minnesotans have a stomach for a 60 to an 80 percent income tax. Uh, that's just working for the government, but uh, that's socialism and from, uh, from my point of view and out here, but uh, your name was mentioned, so you'll get a chance to speak. <laughs> but the question is- I noted that. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I know the rules. I've been on this committee for six years. So, uh, but Representative, uh, uh, the author, uh, Katiza Watoon, uh, question for you. Have you done in your research, um, looked at as to why uh, the cost of childcare is so expensive and why not are we not giving those who work at a daycare center or childcare a tax incentive? And maybe we are, uh, but since uh, I did speak to a, someone who is a, works at a daycare provider here in uh, a center here in town, and they're not paid very much, the workers. Uh, and yet I hear the cost of $2,500 a month to $1,600 $1, to $25 a month for a kid. How come the workers aren't making that? What's the deal? Who's putting that money in their pocket? Why is it so expensive? Um, are we not offering a tax credit or incentive for the workers so they can keep more money in their pocket, therefore perhaps make it affordable to work at a daycare center? And then secondly, if you recall, and I know you have been around the Capitol for a while, that the uh, unionization or the attempt of at our home daycare providers has been a real turn off for some of our private daycare providers. As, and, and along with that, with the state of Minnesota, the health department pushing and, and licensing and really intruding into our home daycare providers, not making it worth uh, the while for home daycare providers to even be in business. 
because their the state is constantly down their throat and mandating and licensing and uh, regulating. So there's a huge loss of our daycare providers, and it's partly due to the policies that have, I've seen in the last 11 years of the Capitol. So um, in your research, have you looked into if there is a tax credit currently and or can we help our daycare providers uh, and increase their productivity by allowing them to keep more of their money instead of just a tax credit for those who have a, a need in the daycare centers? Representative Katitsa Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that you you raised a really good point. Um, absolutely, our the the entire system of childcare is broken, and so while we're not able to address everything um, in this bill, um, really helping the families fill a hole in their pocket and um, and help them um, afford the childcare payments that they already have is is the priority in in this proposal. Um, you may remember back in 2019, I actually introduced House File One, which was the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Act, and um, that was a really um, all encompassing um, proposal for childcare and um, early childhood policy. So I mean, we were raising CCAP rates, we were increasing uh, investments in scholarships, we were um, uh, so allowing then daycare providers to um, earn more um, of the child care assistance program um, reimbursement rate. So th there's a number of things that we are working to do and have previously introduced. Um, we're, we're certainly not where we need to be, but um, I think that those conversations are ongoing. Um, when, when you mentioned um, your concern about regulations and, and what that looks like here in Minnesota versus some of the other states across the nation, I mean, all you have to do is go across to St. Croix to look at a very different child care regulatory environment. And you will see that Wisconsin is dealing with the exact same issues that we are. Um, we're losing child care providers. They're losing child care providers. It's a really tough business to be in. And, um, and, and while it's um, some, some regulations may contribute to folks leaving the industry, um, it really doesn't seem to be the end all be all because there are um, all across the nation, red states, blue states, Purple states, wherever um, we're, we're all we're all facing this decline in the child care industry. So I think um, absolutely we need to work together, put on our um, creative hats, and um, and see what we can do to support our child care providers. Um, but then also we need to take action on this to make sure that parents have the the help that they need to um, find the care that's uh, not not so affordable for their kids right now. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative. Question for you. In your bill um, and uh, your testimony, did you say it, uh, the cap at $110,000 salary can qualify for this uh, credit? Is that, can you correct me if that's not the uh, case? Representative Katitsa Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, that's, that's not correct, um, Representative McDonald. So the, um, the credit will cover 50% of the cost until annual gross income reaches 125,000. And then it slowly begins to phase down um, to 20% of eligible costs. And then once uh, annual gross income hits $400,000, then the, I mean, there will be a significant number of families who qualify for this credit that don't currently. Uh, right now, the cutoff um, for the phase out or phase down, excuse me, begins around $53,000. So this is a, a massive expansion of, of the tax cut that we have in place, uh, tax credit that we have in place right now for these families. Um, and it'll, it'll um, fill a hole in the pocket um, for, for a number of families across the middle income spectrum. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I won't belabor this at all. Uh, so based on what you said, Representative, uh, so if a family making 375000 can still qualify for this credit, is that correct? Representative Kutitsa Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, that's correct. If they have qualifying um, children under the age of five. Um, and, and I do want to point out um, that while we're expanding the um, uh, qualif qualifications um, and expanding the, um, the credit percentage, um, th those families who have children over the age of five or who have other dependents um, living with them, the, the existing um, dependent care credit is still going to be in place. So um, while, while this is really targeting our lower, um, the, the earliest uh, Minnesotans and, and their families, we're not making any changes to um, the existing dependent care credit. So, that, so those families um, still can receive what they receive right now. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative, uh, families that make 399,000 uh, 
probably is it wouldn't necessarily need this credit. Did you, uh, Representative Katitsa Watun, did you hear that? I, it was broken up a little bit. Would you repeat that, Representative McDonald? I couldn't hear it very well. You're right. I asked uh, for families that are making $399,000, do not you think this credit is a little excessive for them? Or not necessary if you're bringing in $399,000. Representative Katitsa Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Representative McDonald, I think you, you're asking about um, families who make um, $399,000 a year and whether or not they need this credit. Um, I think that that's a really good point. Um, they're, they're the, the, um, we, what we are hoping to do with this is just expand the qualifications. We know that there are uh, a number of families who um, don't qualify right now for really any, um, any assistance. When it comes to child care and so i think a number of our testifiers pointed that out um we know also that you know if if, if um two individuals who are married filing jointly are making fifty thousand dollars i mean that they've already hit a six-figure income and um and, and as you go up and as as your costs go up as um you know if you are if you're paying for um college education um loans um down the, down the line i mean it's it's not um out of out of line to think that you know, families may need some sort of assistance um, for child care, especially depending on how many kids they have um, that they're looking to take care of while both parents may be working outside the home. Representative McDonald. Mr. Chair, I see there's other hands, so I'll close just by saying this, that uh, one of the, the last testifiers said that, uh, unfortunately, one of her friends is leaving the state because of the high cost of child care. I would presume it's the high cost of living in Minnesota all over the place because we are a very high tax state income tax, sales tax, uh, corporate tax, and the death tax. So uh, we are a high tax state and we need to do something about it uh, and lower the tax rate so people can stay here, live here, and support child care. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative, well, Representative Joaquin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to point out that those child care providers that get those low wages could really uh, use an expansion of this credit as well. So getting back to focusing on the bill before us, I just wanted to thank um, Chair Marquardt for really having that focus on our workforce um, and making sure that we can have a workforce there for our employers and looking at ways we can help those um, people be able to stay in that workforce. I think it's really important. Um, and I have one quick question for Representative Katizu Tun. And just so I can frame, you know, understand what our current child care credit looks like. So could you quick run through those numbers again on the current child care credit? Representative Katizu Tun. Thank you, um, Chair Joachim, for, um, for bringing that up. Um, so yes, we are not only expanding the credit um, from 35% to 50%, but then um, we're expanding the eligible uh, expenses and, and costs. Um, so right now, the maximum Minnesota and federal credit is um, $1,050 for one child and $2,100 for two children or more. Um, so larger families with three or more children don't have any additional um, they don't have any additional eligible benefit. And um, I think that that was a change that was really important to me personally. Um, my husband and I adopted three children um, back in 2018. And at that point in time, we had a two-year-old, a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And, um, and it's, it's <laughs> there's, there are not a lot of people having large families these days. And so I think that um, if that's something that people wanna do, it's really important that we, um, we do what we can, um, an extra, qualifying expense of $5,000 can really help people um, if, um, if that is their family situation. So um, we are drastically um, increasing the amount that they are eligible to claim. And then, so uh, the, the maximum right now, again, for one child, $1,050, it would then go up to $5,000. Um, and then from for two children, 2,100, it would not then go up to 10,000. And then um, for three or more children, um, right now that is again, $2,100. Um, but they would be eligible for uh, $12,050. Oh, 500, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Chair. Excellently explained there, Representative. So, uh, Representative Joaquin. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Katiza Batun, can you remind me though, when that, on the current credit, when does the phase out start? I think you said 53,000. 
Representative Katitsa with two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correct. It starts at $53,630 of the annual and annualized um, income. Representative Joaquin. Thank you. That's what I thought I, I heard you say. And I just kind of wanted to paint a picture of that. Just so folks know, a starting teacher in Minnesota makes on average $33,000 a year. And if their uh, partner is making $15 an hour, um, that's who we're talking about. Okay, that's those are the those are the folks that are we're talking about. And that starting teacher probably has school loans, and they may um, be just getting a mortgage or even just trying to pay rent in um, in our state. So I just wanted to paint that picture, and also wanted to say that um, this is really an economic issue. Bottom line, it's an economic issue. Recently, the Minnesota Chamber members were um, surveyed. And 76% of them said um, the importance, sorry, yeah, 62% of them said the importance of childcare shortages were an issue with their employers. There was an issue in hiring employees and it was an issue with growth for their own businesses. Um, we have just in the Twin Cities alone, we have 76% of all parents working outside of the home if they can afford it and a lot can't. And there's been a national survey saying that if we just raise, if we just lower the price in childcare by 10%, um, you will get an increase in up to 11% in just maternal women moving back into the workforce. That doesn't even include all parents working, going back into the workforce. And women are 42% either their sole or primary breadwinner in the family. And we've seen that drastic decline of women in the workforce highlighted during COVID. And we can't afford to do that in Minnesota. We can't afford to leave people behind like that. And I just, I, I wanted, to, wanted to lift this up too, because back in 1995, when I was working in the journalism field and my husband was a starting teacher and we had our first child, if I would have continued my job, I would have been paying just for childcare. So I chose to stay home, but we still struggled. Not only that my husband worked three other jobs, I worked in waitress at night when he came home and we still struggled to meet our bills. So I know, you know, I wouldn't have traded it for the world, the time I spent with our children. We were lucky to even have that choice. And the only reason we did is because we worked so many extra jobs. So there is a lot of Minnesotans that don't have that opportunity and we need to be there to help them if we wanna see our economy grow. Um, so, you know, like I said, bottom line, this is about making sure that we have a workforce out there in Minnesota going into the future and that we're attractive to folks coming into state to work out of state to work here. So thank you so much, uh, Representative. I also wanna thank you for all the work you're doing on the other aspect of our childcare sector, making sure that employees are paid better, making sure that our childcare, um, childcare stay open and have the support that they need to do that too. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Gomez, your name was mentioned a while back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep it brief because I, I talked a lot, but you know, we haven't had much hand-to-hand -hand combat yet in this committee, but me and Representative McDonald have uh, have talked once or twice before about these issues. But uh, so, you know, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to point out, you know, um, we pulled out Denmark, I think, as a, or Norway or something as, as an example, and they do spend 60 times as much as the United States spends on, on childcare for, for a toddler. But there, I mean, I can read you the list. I can't because I would take up almost the whole rest of our time together if I read you the entire list of nations that contribute more than the United States does to, to childcare. But I mean, Latvia, Japan, Spain, Poland, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, Chile, Portugal, Canada, Mexico, Turkey, Greece, New Zealand. I mean, it's not just certainly, um, you know, countries that, that you might, uh, decide our, our bastions of socialism um, that are doing a better job for their people at this than we are. So, you know, I just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that. Um, and also just that it's, it's not safe to make assumptions about why people um, move out of the state of Minnesota. I think if our testifiers um, friend said they moved out of Minnesota because they couldn't afford the child, the cost of childcare, it's probably about that and not the estate tax that, 99.9% .9 of Minnesotans will never ever pay because we're not millionaires. So I think we need to maybe take people at their word on that. Thank you. 
Representative Hertoz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess I, I want to thank uh, Representative uh, Kutiza Watun for bringing this subject uh, to the forefront. I do believe that uh, families uh, create strong neighborhoods. Having strong neighborhoods uh, makes stronger communities. And uh, what I have witnessed change uh, during my lifetime is uh, we kind of have a new definition of family. And there are certainly challenges when you don't have two incomes uh, to meet some of these obligations. Like uh, Representative Yu Kim, this subject and this issue with regard to daycare is not a new problem. Uh, it was a problem back when she was raising kids, and I'm a little bit older than her, and it was no different for us. Uh, we had three children. My wife was a nurse. We did the math, and it made sense to quit being a nurse and to stay home. And even though nurses' wages were not what they are today, adjusted for inflation, it was still comparable. So but she had a, a skilled job and you know paid fairly well, but all things told, when you had the income minus payroll taxes plus commuting costs going to to and from work, all of it said uh, she was working for less than a buck an hour. And so those are decisions that, that do have to be made. So my question to uh, the representative would be, you know, <clears throat> I'd just like to point out that in Minnesota, our minimum tax rate on individual income for our lowest income wage earners and workers is higher than the maximum rate in 23 other states. My question would be, shouldn't we take a balanced approach to this? I mean, I'm, I'm all for helping families get ahead and lift themselves out of poverty, but shouldn't we not also be making structural changes in our tax code, uh, particularly right now in a time of surplus to make sure that hardworking families are incentivized to work and take home more of their paycheck on every paycheck? So I think there should almost be kind of a balance of making sure that the state doesn't take your money and then decides whether or not you're worthy of having some of your money back in the form of a rebate, but we should take kind of a two-pronged approach to solving the problems of those who are uh, experiencing the, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And I think this is that we should have a serious debate about in this committee, uh, given the amount of surplus that we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Representative Kotitsa Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your comments, Representative Hertas. Um, I, I um, have, have I'm, I'm privileged to um, serve in this body along so many other um, amazing people um, who have raised children, who have um, done really incredible and wonderful things, and and who serve such um, you know different districts than myself. Um, I think that. Uh, I think that you have a fair point. Um, and I, I don't have the pleasure to serve on this committee. I'm visiting today and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion with you all. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be tuning in, I'll be paying attention to the conversations that you guys have um, and, and some of the other bills that are introduced by um, perhaps, you know, some members on my side of the aisle, members on your side of the aisle about what we can do um, to, to build a better Minnesota for everyone. Thank you. Representative Hertoz, anything further? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative uh, Katiza Watun. Uh, I was hopeful that uh, that might be the response, and I, I think that we can put the partisan issues aside, and you know, we need to kind of balance uh, help and relief with some structural reform. We have the time and the opportunity to do it. If it can't happen now, it's never going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And, and one interesting note to all of that in that a lot of people might forget is that a few years ago when we doubled the standard deduction and kept the dependent exemptions, uh, other than the states that of course don't have an income tax at all, for a family of four, we actually have the highest zero tax bracket uh, of any state. It's like 34,800 if you take the standard deduction plus the two exemptions. So, uh, you know, so I mean, again, when you look at families and and rates sometimes it doesn't, or the rates don't always tell the full story on things. But, but um, thanks for that point. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative Watiza Katoon, um, under this bill, would daycare providers themselves qualify for the tax credit if they had their children in their own daycare? Representative Katiza Watoon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, uh, thank you, Representative Swedzinski, for that question. I actually thought of pointing that out earlier, and then I forgot um, in my comments to uh, Representative McDonald. Um, for, for those people who, um, like one of our testifiers, um, uh, has, has their children in their own um, at-home daycare, they do um, qualify um, for, for this credit. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Representative Wikiza, I'm sorry. Um, is it, are you, do you have to have your children in a licensed daycare to, to qualify? Representative Katitsa Watun. Uh, thank you, Mr. Or Mr. Chair and um, Representative Swadzinski. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think that that is the case. Um, and I, um, I will double check the language and I can, I can confirm. Yeah, and maybe Mr. Williams, could you help out on that? at all. I think I, I'm, I'm trying to look and I, there's um... uh, Representative Mark Wharton, Representative yes. uh, Swazinski, are you talking about the provision specifically for people who operate a at-home daycare and send their own children to that daycare or more generally for the credit? More generally for the credit, sir. Mr. Uh, Chair Mark Wharton, Representative Swazinski, uh, the bill relies on the federal definition of employment-related expenses that are used for the federal dependent care credit. I'm not sure if it's limited to licensed uh, daycares only, so I could follow up with that uh, after the committee hearing. Thank you very much. Anything further, Representative Swazinski? No, that kind of hits it on the head. You know, yeah. you know, my thought is, um, you know, part of this bill's goal is to, you know, drive parents out of the home and into the workforce. Um, you know, there is value. Um, I believe that a, a parent is in the home helping to raise children, um, you know, by passing on beliefs, passing on uh, uh, work ethic in the home, whether it's a mom or a dad, doesn't matter. Um, there is value to that uh, beyond just making sure that people are available to be employed by our, our, our corporations and businesses. And, you know, I think, you know, this, this bill does try to reach out and solve a, a bill of, of work shortages. Um, but, you know, let's keep in mind, um, you know, we've killed 60 million people in this country uh, that never had a chance to live um, out of convenience. And, um, you know, this is part of that process of the growing pains of, of our country and what we've done in the last 40, 45 years. And, uh, you know, it's difficult and, and we got to try to find some ways to fix it. But, um, you know, we have fundamental issues and, and detriments in our society. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Kutitsa Batu. Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Representative Swedzinski, I appreciate your comments. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, some of you may be surprised to discover that outside of the legislature, which is supposed to be a part-time legislature. And I think we all have some interesting thoughts on how the last couple of years have gone at least. Um, I am a stay-at-home mother. So um, I, I do have four kids, our oldest is eight. I have a six-year-old, I have a five-year-old and I have an 18-month-old. Um, and so I, I concur <laughs> with, with uh, those of you who have, um, uh, shared the, the fact how, how much of a value um, having a parent who is able and, and willing to stay home and raise their children is. Um, and I think that I would, I would welcome um, continued thoughts and um, suggestions to improve this bill. Um, potentially, I know Representative Miller had mentioned earlier, um, if, if there's a way to even expand it um, such that we can um, uh, allow folks who are home, um, who are Representative Katitsa Watun, you're cutting out here. You, you have frozen. You hear me? We, I can right now, yes, but not up to that point. Um, I, was, I was just sharing that um, the fact that I'm a stay-at-home parent outside the legislature and that I would be willing to have um, bipartisan discussions with other members and, and see if we can um, expand the credit even further to, um, to allow further support for stay-at-home parents. Very good. Any other members' comments or questions? Representative Katitsa Watun, any closing comments on your bill as amended? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I, I really appreciate the discussion today and all the feedback. Um, all of our testifiers who shared their stories. Uh, I guess in closing, um, I, I just wanna um, point out that research by Nobel winning prize uh, 
Nobel Prize winning econ economist uh, James Heckman has shown that for each dollar invested in quality early childhood programming, it can, it can yield up to $16 in return. So many families in Minnesota don't qualify for the support that's currently available for childcare. And we know that the pandemic hasn't impacted all Minnesotans equally. Uh, the expansion and creation of the Great Start uh, Child Care and Dependent Care Credit puts money back in the pockets of middle income families this proposal would not only help provide a great start to every child in Minnesota, but also a great start for a bipartisan movement to prioritize family economic security. As we consider how to invest this historic surplus in the future of the state of Minnesota, I would ask that you support a historic tax cut for our littlest Minnesotans and their families. Thank you so much for your consideration. Well, thank you very much, uh, Representative Katisa Batum, for bringing this forward and for uh, your thoughts today. And you know, these last two days, uh, members, is, you know, the tax committee, we're going to focus like a laser beam on this workforce shortage problem. I mean, there is no doubt that this might be the biggest challenge facing our economy right now in so many ways, leading to inflation and, and work shortage of workers in all of these important fields and supply chain, supply disruptions and so forth. So, you know, these two approaches that we've had the last two days and greatly expanding the student loan credit and today the uh, great start uh, child care and dependent credit doesn't solve all the problems, but I do think it sends a very clear message out there is that we want to address this workforce shortage and we know we have to not only retain our young workers and our families, but attract young workers and families to the state. And I think what you've heard the last few days uh, goes a long way in doing that. And they're big ideas. There's no doubt about this. These are big ideas, but those are the type of things we need to do uh, at this time uh, to really make sure our economy moves forward and that we make sure we can improve our quality of life for everyone everywhere in the state. So um, with that, Representative Joaquin renews her motion to lay over uh, House file 3283 as amended for possible inclusion into the omnibus um, tax bill. Uh, members, thank you so much. Uh, coming up next week, we have three bills on Tuesday by Representative Bonner, Representative Erdahl, and Representative Robbins. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, we're scheduled to hear the governor's tax bill. We're hoping that will be introduced on Monday so that would give folks a couple days uh, before Wednesday to be able to take a good look at the language and so forth. So with that members, uh, thanks for your work this week and have a wonderful weekend coming up. And with that, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.